Good morning, everyone. Welcome to this morning's study. Uh, we're going to continue studying um, in uh, the book of Daniel, chapter 10, and uh, we're going to be dealing with the kings. And I just got to switch this here. I don't know what happened. So, still done. Okay, so before we begin, can you join me in a word of prayer? Dear Father in heaven, we are thankful for the time that we have to study here this morning, and we invite your Holy Spirit to instruct us. We know, Lord, that there are things that we are studying that we don't fully understand, and we need uh, your wisdom. We ask that we can follow the rules laid out in God's word that you gave to William Miller and that uh, have been amplified in these last days. And we pray, Lord, that uh, you can see things that we haven't seen before that can encourage us and strengthen our faith in giving a message to the world. We thank you, Lord, for your blessings this time that we have. And we just pray that as each person seeks your presence, that they can know you and that they can be um, lifted up above this world's problems. Be with us now through thy spirit, we pray and ask in Jesus' name. Amen. <clears throat> well, good morning again. So we have in front of us here the same chart we were looking at yesterday. Now, I know for some people it can be a little bit tedious, but I think these details uh, are important. Now, um, in a study that D Dwight did yesterday, he had a statement from the Spirit of Prophecy talking about how we need to, uh, I can't remember the wording, but uh, uh, was the suggestion that we need to uh, study God's word and uh, what was the word that she, that she used, Dwight? Do you remember in that statement that we read about, like, wasn't the word detail, exactitude or something like that? It was exactitude, yes. Okay, yeah. So to study God's word with exactitude um, instead of sort of uh, just rushing over things, yeah, haphazardly or rushing over things willy-nilly, um, or sloppily, that we need to pay pay attention to the details in God's word uh, because there's light in those things. So, I mean, that's what we have been doing in, in our study over the last few years. We've become more and more precise, and this preciseness has yielded all kinds of um, uh, miraculous things in God's word. So... Um, now, it is kind of interesting because uh, yesterday I gave my personal testimony uh, on Zoom with um, these Romanian uh, uh, gypsies. So they've been doing a ministry for the last few years since COVID and um, ministering to German, Romanian and I think Hungarian gypsies. Um, so it was translated into Romanian. So I had to speak and then stop and um and they're going to be uh, i'm going to be doing 10 series on daniel chapter 9 um you mean so a 10 day series. 10 yeah 10 day series part of me on daniel chapter 9 and then he says he wants me to do more things we will see how the series goes um and uh, it's kind of late for me i have to do it at 10 o'clock at night um, which ends up being seven o'clock in the morning there. Um, so it's going to be difficult going to bed that late because I won't go to bed till 11. So normally I go to bed about 9.30. So hopefully I can uh, get some naps in there. But um, he thinks that he's going to want me on a regular basis over time as sort of a, a guest speaker dealing with chronology. So we'll see what happens. But it was it was pretty interesting. And uh, so, so I need your prayers in that regard. But I was preparing my notes for uh, the study, 
And of course, I'm going to address this chronology, the chronology of not as in much detail as we're doing here, but the chronology of the 70 years and the end of the 70 years. And, um, you know, probably over time, I'll be able to present more. But for now, I just want to, want to be able to do some very simple things. But here we're doing uh, this very precise detail. Now, we looked at these statements, uh, but I want to look at them again. So I've looked at them many different times. But one of the things I found in the Spirit of Prophecy that I had worked out this chronology, this chronology of um, the two, de the, the three decrees, but these two decrees, that is Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree, in this way where I, I saw that uh, Darius's decree would have occurred in 516 uh, BC, not usually where people place it is um, sometimes in 522, sometimes in 520. Now, Ellen White is the only source that I have found that agrees with me. That is, I have not found any statements by anybody that Ellen White would have had contact with or read their books or anything that would say that there's 20 years or more between Cyrus's decree and Darius's decree. Everyone is going to place them about uh, 14 to 16 years apart. And that to me was a confirmation of what I had worked out in this chronology. Um, so so it, it is rather interesting when she talks about that 20 years and then nearly 20 years from when they return to um, Judah, to Jerusalem and Darius's decree. So that places Darius's decree in 516. So, so it's just a little bit of a review of what we looked at yesterday. Is there, was there any questions about this chronology? <clears throat> Are people pretty satisfied that it's uh, uh, accurate? Okay. So where where we need to go um, is as we started looking at this at Ezra. So we know we have Cyrus's decree. So we're just gonna go over some of this, uh, this history. So we have Cyrus's decree. We know Cyrus is um, this messianic figure that Isaiah prophesies about. And um, so he fulfills that prophecy. <clears throat> um, so let me think here, where do we need to go? So, um, so we started looking at this Ezra chapter one. Now in the first year of Cyrus, king of Persia, the word of the Lord by the mouth of Jeremiah might be fulfilled. The Lord stirred up the spirit of Cyrus, king of Persia, that he made a proclamation throughout all his kingdom and put it also in writing, saying, thus says Cyrus, king of Persia, the Lord God of heaven hath given me all the kingdoms of the earth and hath charged me to build him in a house of Jerusalem, which is in Judah. So we can see here that uh, Cyrus is aware of Isaiah's decree, right? That seems pretty evident. Yes. Okay. And so he's going to make this decree. He's going to provide all of these um, you know, gold and silver goods, beasts, there's all these different things that he provides, they're going to return. Now in Ezra chapter two, it deals with this return. And we know there came in with Zerubbabel. So Zerubbabel, which we studied in uh, the book of Zechariah, uh, Zerubbabel, he's going to be the one that lays the foundation of the temple. He's gonna be the one that completes the temple, right? And, and that's going to be according to the book of Zechariah that he completes the temple. So we're going to look at that history as well. So it lists all these different uh, people um, that are going to return. And I don't know if we want to go through all their names. 
Um, but we know that um, it says here, uh, the whole congregation in verse uh, 2, verse 64. So, so when we look here, what do we see as a symbol in Ezra 2, 64? What's that symbol? 26 days of the fourth month. Okay, so it's the 26th day of the fourth month. And so what, what does that tell us? When we see this symbol, we see this verse, Ezra 2, verse 64, and we see a number. Does that Should that draw our attention to this verse? Well, I recall you saying something about 264 times 264, was it? Plus whatever. Is the 165k that was that 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 FFA got? Am I correct in that? Um, so two, 264 times 264. Okay. I think you said something like that. Yeah, I don't um, remember exactly. Uh, I know yeah. 264 times 264 is 69696, but but we know it's the 26th day of the fourth month as a symbol. Right. right. And that, that comes from and then, the prophecy in Revelation 9. So Josiah Lich's prophecy. So we have a symbol. This is a common yeah. symbol of this movement. Or, and you want about the 40 and 2300, like that's 42,360. Yeah. So 42,000. So, so we would have to look at that number. Uh, 42,360. So, so one is it's 42,000 plus 360, right? Um, the number itself, um, I don't think the whole number itself altogether has anything that I see in it, but um, uh, I'm just looking at it here, number empire. Um, so, you know, it's divisors, uh, there's 32 divisors, the sum of the divisors is 127,440. Uh, the factorization is uh, two times two times three times five times 353. So 353 is uh, the shortest uh, a Jewish year. So a Jewish year can be 353, 354, 355 days. Or it can be 383, 384, 385. So there's six different lengths that a Jewish year can be. So 353 is the shortest. And um, so that would be 353. And then, um, so you see here. So 353 by 120 would be um, this number. So if we were going to just look at it as this 42,360, um, that it's, if we broke it down to the basic um, <clears throat> numbers, it can be 353 by 120. So now, now it says, besides their servants and their maids, of whom there were 7,337, there were among them 200 singing men and women. And then it gives the number of their horses, 736, their mules, 245, their camels, 435. Um, uh, their asses, 6,720. So we have these numbers here. Are they important? They should be important. Okay, so they should be important. Now, I don't see the importance of them at the moment, 
right? I mean, we would have to analyze them a little bit. Um, now, the 7,337, uh, is that significant, Stephen? So their servants and their maids, there was 7,337. So what's the significance of that? Stephen, are you there? You'd say it has to do something with Genesis 1, I think. Well, we know the 73 and the 37, right? So Stephen has dealt with that before. So he's maybe not there. He's online, but he's not either not listening or something. But so the 7337 is a number that Stephen dealt with. Um, and I can't remember all the details of it, <clears throat> but it, 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 yeah, it has something to do with uh, in the book of Genesis, but I don't remember what. And the number itself, um, I don't know if he did it as 7337 or he just dealt with 73 and 27, but this number 7337 is 11 times 23 times 29. So it would be the shortest month, time, which is 29 times 23 representing 2300 days and the number 11. Okay. So these are things that we're going to have to look at as we continue to go through these studies. But I, I don't know if we have time to, to try to analyze all these numbers at the moment. Um, you know, 200 singing men and women. Um, so among those servants and maids, there was 200 that were singing men and women. Um, the, the 736 horses and 245 mules, the 435 camels, their asses, 6,720. So all of these numbers must have some significance. Now, it's kind of interesting, Ezra 2, verse 67, um, notice that we're going to have 6,720. So you're going to have that 6, 7, and 2 in that verse. And so so I don't, I don't know exactly what that would mean. And if you looked at all of these, so let's just look at that verse a little bit. So what are the numbers that are there? There's 435 and 6,720. So what, if we, if we drew those out, what digits would we have? We have 7,620 and uh, 4,035. So what digits do we have in that verse? 2 verse You guys got your thinking caps on here? So what digits? So if we draw drew out those numbers, 762435. So how could we represent those digits? So do we have seven, six, five, four, three, and two? It would appear so, yes. Now, what is 765432? A countdown. Okay. But 
but it, it's a specific thing. If I said seven, six, five, four, three, two, plus one, what would I have? Do we remember um, the MOAD? All right, yeah. Okay, so this is the number of parts in a month. So the Jews said that the month is divided into seven, six, five, four, three, two, plus one parts. That is, the day is uh, 2,000. Uh, uh, 25,920 parts. And if you take um, this number, 7654321 plus one, and you divide it by 25920, you're going to get 29.530594. So in the time of, of Ezra, the month was 29,000, or not 29, 29.530594 days long, right? Now, they didn't use decimals back then. And so in order to represent how long a month was in days, they needed to have a division of the day that could then be represented as a month. And so it's pretty remarkable that they use this number. And so what most people think is, well, they wanted the month to be 7654321 plus one days or one parts long. And so they just made the day so that it would work out. And this is very, very precise. I mean, um, you know, to, to realize that they could figure out the day to such uh you know, basically to six de de decimal points, parts of a day, right? Now, we had found out in studying um, the precession of the equinoxes that the precession of the equinoxes is 25,920 years. And the fact that those years match up with the parts of the Hebrew day and that these things all fit together is a miracle of God. It's something that shows design. So here in these verses, we are, we are having numbers that are presented to us that are part of our chronology. You know, 42,360, right? So 42,360. And I would think just taking the 42,000 as a symbol um, and the 360 as a symbol put together in Ezra 2 verse 64. And then some of these other symbols. So um, definitely in Ezra 2, verse 67, um, we have these numbers that are those digits of the Molad interval. So that, that to me is kind of remarkable. Now, there's other things that we could look at, you know, how detailed we want to get regarding this history. I, I'm pretty sure we could spend, um, you know, looking at all these different names the Hebrew numbers attached to them, the meanings of the names, the numbers that are given, right? So you have this name and it says how many people of the children of Zatu, for instance, 945. Well, you know, 945, is that significant or not, right? You know, how would we look at that number? So there's lots that we could do. Um, we could spend a lot of time looking at this, which I don't think I want to do at the present time. But we can see that there are things here that show that these numbers are not insignificant. And, and I haven't spent time analyzing these numbers in this chapter. So, I mean, it's something we may do in the future. <clears throat> now, where we go to then is chapter three. So we know when the seventh month was come and the children of Israel were in the cities, the people gathered themselves together as one man to Jerusalem. And there stood up Yeshua, son of Josadak, and his brethren, the priests, and Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and his brethren, and builded the altar of God 
of Israel to offer burnt offerings thereon, as it is written in the law of Moses, the man of God. So they set up this altar, and it just says when the seventh month was come. So this would be on the first day of the seventh month, right? Would we? Is that how we would interpret that verse? Even though it doesn't say it's on the first day, we're saying it's on the first day. So we can accept that that's the, the first day of the seventh month, Rosh Hashanah. They're going to build this altar. Now, we know that the decree was issued, we, we, we believe, on the 24th day of the first month. So remember when Ezra left Babylon in uh, 457, he's going to leave on the first day of the first month. And on the 12th day of the first month, they're going to leave the river Ahava. And then they're going to arrive at Jerusalem on the first day of the fifth month. So their journey is basically four months to go from Babylon to Jerusalem, right? Now, if the decree is issued on the 24th day of the first month, I mean, they're not going to leave that day. But these people that return to Jerusalem are going to return in probably about the same amount of time, about four months. So if they build an altar on the first day of the seventh month, you know, it is possible that they left um, sometime in the second month to travel to Jerusalem. Is that reasonable? Yes. Okay. So, so we, we can see that this, this chronology works out and when Ellen White says that there's it was less than 20 years from when they uh, arrived to Jerusalem and Darius's decree we can see that that decree had to occur sometime between the spring and the fall sometime between the second month and the seventh month on the Jewish calendar for it to have been more than 20 years between the two decrees but less than 20 years between them arriving to Jerusalem and the second decree. So this places that decree in the summer of 516 BC. That's going to complete the temple. So Darius's decree, which we're going to look at, you know, it's based on understanding these two events, the issuing of the decree by Cyrus and the arrival of uh, the Jews under Cyrus's decree. An Ellen White statement regarding the time between the decrees and the time between when they arrive at Jerusalem. So they so they build this altar. Uh, they're going to keep the Feast of Tabernacles, right? So it doesn't say anything about them keeping uh, the Day of Atonement, right? One is they don't have a sanctuary yet, right? They just have an altar, but they can keep the Feast of Tabernacles. Um, so it says in verse four, they kept also the Feast of Tabernacles, as it is written, and offered daily burnt offerings by number, according to the custom, as the duty of every day required. So it's actually the daily duty because the word day says every day, but that's just day, day, right? So in Hebrew, you can see here the Hebrews number 3117, 3117, that's Yom. And um, so you could say day by day, uh, as was required day by day. And this word duty happens to be that word debar that we've seen before, 1697. So this is just the word. You could say it's commandment. Um, but it's the word according as the word required. And so they're going to do this day by day. So every every day. And in the Hebrew, just to show you here, even though you don't all read Hebrew, if you look at this, you'll see here it's going to say um, 
the Dabar, that's uh, Dalef Bet Resh, and then it's got Yom, um, 3117, and then it has again, but it says day, or day in the days of them, is what it says. So, the days of them. So, days in the days of them is literally how you would translate this. <clears throat> okay, so so they're going to offer these burnt offerings. So that's the daily burnt offerings, right? Those would be uh, the morning and evening sacrifice. Um, and afterward offered the continual burnt, burnt, offer, burnt offering, both of the new moons and of the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. So they're going to continue this continual burnt offering. Um, and they're also going to do the new moons. They're going to recognize the new moons and all the set feasts of the Lord that were consecrated and of everyone that willingly offered a free will offering unto the Lord. So they're going to use this altar for different types of offerings. And it says here, from the first day of the seventh month began they to offer burnt offerings unto the Lord. So here, clearly it's the first day of the seventh month. But the foundation of the temple was not yet laid. And it's going to talk about the money that they gave and then the rebuilding of the temple. Um, okay, so in Ezra 6.15... So Angela has a note here, comment. Um, Ezra 6.15, Nehemiah 6.15 are completing temple and wall. 5.16 of Darius's decree scrambled. That's interesting. So um, what she's referring to here is you have Ezra 6.15. The house was finished on the third day of the month, Adar, which is the sixth year of the reign of Darius the king. And then in Nehemiah chapter 6, verse 15, it says, and so they finished in the 25th day of the month, Elu, which is the, the sixth month, in 52 days. So in both of these, these are talking about a completion. This one dealing with the wall in Ezra chapter 6, verse 15. This one dealing with the temple. And we're saying that that decree um, of Darius was in 516. That's actually just an inversion of these two verses numerically. So 516 BC is uh, connected to this 615 symbol. Okay, so interesting point that she notes. <clears throat> So in uh, chapter three, then it says in the second year of their coming unto the house of God at Jerusalem in the second month began Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel and Jeshua, the son of Josedek, and the remnant of their brethren, the priests and the Levites and all they that were come out of the captivity unto Jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. So that this is in the second month. Right. So. So we know it was in the seventh month in um, 586 that they're going to build this temple. So in 586 BC, or 536, pardon me, 536 BC in the second month. And that's going to be, um, the second month is going to begin on April 30th, 536. Oh, pardon me. So that's going to be, that's 536. I need 535. So it's going to be the next year, 535. And it's going to be, um, so the first day of the first month is April 19th. And, which is interesting, but they're going to start on the second month. So that's going to be May 19th, 535. I think that's what I had in my chart. Staying on. Yeah, May 19th, that's going to be the, the first day of the second month. Now, so it doesn't tell us which day of the month here. 
right? It just tells us in this in this in the second year in the second month. So what's the significant second year, second month? Now, if they were using the Babylonian calendar, it'd be uh, May 18th, but um, but it's the second month, second year. So we have 2-2, two, two, right? This number of restoration. So we can see that the symbol here for beginning to restore the temple is the symbol of restoration. You know, they're not going to start in the first month. You know, they're not going to start in the third month. They're not going to start, you know, earlier in the year. It's going to be the second month. Now, when was the foundation of Solomon's temple laid? What date on the biblical calendar? Uh, just another point. Yeah, okay. Uh, second day. Sorry, second year, second month. Yeah. Maybe as a symbol, got a 390. Okay. 390. One year, one month. Okay. So um, explain. Well, one year, one month. 360 plus 30. Okay. So I see what you're saying. So one year from when... Uh, so it's the second year, so that's one year, and then it's one month. So that's a symbol of 390. And, and if you even go one month and then the one day going to the first day of the second month, that'd be 391, right? Yes. Okay. Now, um, in Second Chronicles 3, verse 2, uh, when Solomon builds the temple, it says Solomon began to build the house of the Lord at Jerusalem on, in Mount Moriah, where the Lord appeared unto David, his father, in the place that David had prepared in the threshing floor of Ornan, the Jeb Jebusite. And he began to build in the second day of the second month in the fourth year of his reign. So here they have this um, uh, second second, right? So two, two as a symbol as well even though this is the first time that the temple is going to be built. Obviously, we have the sanctuary, but here this is Solomon's temple. So we see that second month as well, as, as well as the second day. <clears throat> so your question was the year when the temple began to be built? Yeah. So... So I think it was it, 2006 BC. So, so, yeah, um, so the temple, you're talking about Solomon's temple or this temple? What, what, what did you say? I didn't hear the number. Yes, I think you had asked about Solomon's temple. Yeah, so 1006 BC. Yeah, in the second day of the second month. Now, this That's temple is going to be built, it's they're going to start earlier, but they're not going to complete it until uh, 490 years after Solomon's temple is, well, so Solomon's temple begins to be built in uh, 10, 1013, right? So he's going to be 1013 BC in the second day of the second month, they start to build. And then they complete it in 1006. Right. So seven years later. Right. So it's going to start on the, uh, the second day of the second month in the fourth year of Solomon. And then he's going to complete it in the eighth month. In the um, 11th year of Solomon. Is that correct? Yes. OK. Now. One of the things uh, dealing with Solomon's temple that, that I haven't fully resolved is 
I had assumed in the past that the temple was completed in the 11th year of Solomon's reign, in the eighth month, and that they're going to wait basically a year until they dedicate the temple. But I've changed my mind about that. I don't know if I'm right. Uh, but I've taken the view that when they say it was completed in the eighth month of the 11th year of his reign, that what they're saying is in the eighth month, the dedication had already been accomplished. Everything was finished. So the seventh month, they're going to have the dedication. But technically, because the, when the seventh month ends, the temple is now completed. So, so it's really about um, uh, the period of time is uh, from his fourth year to his 11th year. And that's going to be seven and a half years for him to complete the temple. Right. From when he first. Because uh, it's going to start in the second month and finish in the eighth month. So that's going to be six months. Uh, but the dedication is going to occur in the seventh month. So technically, it's not finished until after the dedication is over. Now, I don't know if I'm right about that, but. Um, in trying to work things out, it seemed to make the most sense. Yeah, I don't. I can't. I can't really see it. Them finishing it, and then waiting them waiting for almost over a year before they actually right. dedicate right. it. Yeah, it just seems very long. Yeah, that's and, and the, yeah, and then the they thing. wouldn't be able to do anything with it. You know, for that whole year, they have just this temple sitting there. It didn't really make any sense. So I changed my opinion about that. So I, I've moved it that way. So if that makes sense to you, that's good too. And um, then the, the, the Feast of Tabernacles is on the, the 15th of the seventh month. Yeah. And then that feast goes on for two weeks, mm -hmm. which is going to take you basically to the end of the month. It's going to take you to like the 29th or 30th before they actually yeah. finish. So you're basically at the you're not right. the month when it's finished. Right, which is why he says it's it's completed in the eighth month. So in the eighth month, it's already completed, is what they're saying there in and that's in First Kings uh, chapter six. So it talks about this. It came to pass in the four hundred and eightieth year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt, in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziph which is the second month that he began to build the house of the Lord. And at the end of this, it says um, in verse 37, in the fourth year was the foundation of the house of, of the Lord laid in the month Ziph. And in the 11th year, in the month Bull, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all the parts thereof and according to all the fashion of it. So he was seven years in building it. So this is going to be seven and a half years. and so this eighth month is just everything is complete. There's not anything that needs to be done. They're not going to wait, um, you know, a year to dedicate it. It's going to it's dedicated in that seventh month in the eleventh year. <clears throat> okay. So now we have this rebuilding of the temple. Uh, that's going to happen, and um so we know that there is uh some things that happen here that that are important um so it says in the second year of their coming unto the house of god at jerusalem in the second month began Zerub, zerubbabel the son of shealtiel and jeshua the son of josedek and the remnant of their brethren the priests and the levites and all that were come out of the captivity unto jerusalem and appointed the Levites from 20 years old and upward to set forward the work of the house of the Lord. Then stood Jeshua, his sons and his brethren, Cadmiel and his sons, the sons of Judah together, to set forward the workmen in the house of God, the sons of Hanadad, with their sons and their brethren, the Levites. And when the builders laid the foundation of the temple of the Lord, they set the priests in their apparel with trumpets, and the Levites, the sons of Asaph, with cymbals, to praise the Lord after the ordinance of King David, king of Israel. And they sang together by course. So when it says after the ordinance of David, king of Israel, this would be according to some of the Psalms. 
that David has, has written, right? Um, but many of the priests and Levites and the chief of the fathers who were ancient men that had seen the first house, when the foundation of this house was laid before their eyes, wept with a loud voice and many shouted aloud for joy so that the people could not discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people for the people shouted with a loud shout and the noise was heard afar off. So what's the significance of this verse here? This um, So remember in Zechariah chapter four, which uh, um, we're going to look at uh, with Dwight's studies, where it talks about the hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. For who hath despised the day of small things? For they shall rejoice and shall see the plummet in the hand of Zerubbabel with those seven, they are the eyes of the Lord, which run to and fro through the whole earth. So this is a pretty important verse. So you can see that it's referencing this building of the temple, right? Would we agree with that? that this is referencing uh, this event in Ezra. That those who see that this temple is not as glorious as Solomon's temple. Outwardly, it was not as glorious, but it was actually seen to be better because of the arrival of the Messiah. Yeah. Right? And we know. And we know that he's going, you know, the Lord whom you seek shall suddenly come to his temple, right? Right. Christ is going to come to this temple. He's going to grace it with his presence, not just as the Shekinah glory, but as uh, God manifest in human flesh, which is the mystery of godliness. So that the glory of and uh, of the latter shall be greater than that of the former, right? So that verse is if I can find it here. That's in Haggai chapter 2. The glory of this latter house shall be greater than of the former, saith the Lord of hosts. And in this place will I give peace, saith the Lord of hosts. Right. And they're going to also refer again here in this section in Haggai to Zerubbabel and Joshua, the son of Josedek. Right. Um, so there's so you can start to see there's lots of of symbolism in these stories. Right. That they're not just, you know, haphazardly put together. And so we need the exactitude to to examine these things and see what they mean so right now we're just kind of looking at this in a, in a in a sort of a you know an overview of what's to come a preview but we're going to have to draw these things on a line so we're going to have to take these these prophecies these stories these events and draw them on a line and we have first we have the events dealing with the decree of Cyrus and the people coming to uh, to Jerusalem and laying the foundation of the temple, um, or first building the altar and then the temple itself. So we have to, and we can see that that should be a line, right? Can we kind of see the line in our head already? That these events can be drawn on a line? And, and it should just be as, easy to see. Yeah. yeah. 
And, and we should be able to recognize that there are symbols here in these stories that help us to place those things on a line. But the other thing is we're saying that this history is paralleling our history, right? That we understand the present by looking at the past. Now, in, in our understanding of these things, we have, you know, we, we've taken that the kings of Persia represent these presidents of the United States. And, and, and we accept that that is correct. So these kings of Persia, we're going to be studying these things. But we know that these events, even though they occur within the kingdom of Persia, that, that there are three distinct decrees and a fourth. And each of these is a line in and of itself. And each of these should illustrate our history. So, so we haven't done it yet, but we're going to do it. Right. So we're going to look at these things now. You know, the natural thing that we would do, you know, and what we have done. So when we want to study Daniel chapter 11, what we do is we we go here to these verses. We draw out these kings of Persia. We see that Xerxes represents Trump. Right. And then we try to discern what these verses are are telling us based upon our understanding <clears throat> based upon premises that we have developed, but we haven't really examined. And, and I believe that as we start to look at this history in more detail, that we will see things about these verses in Daniel 11, and not just these verses, but all of Daniel 11, that can help take these verses and place it in our history so that we can see the parallel with our time. Right. So you, so you see what I'm doing, right? You see how we're approaching this. We're not starting with a conclusion. We're just looking at the verses and trying to understand what these verses are saying. And so we need to understand the history. So if we don't understand this history, then we're going to be misled uh, when we try to um, give an interpretation for our time. So this story here dealing with the, the people, some of them shouting for joy and some of them weeping. Um, we know that these, these are illustrations, these are symbols. And we should be able to place these in our history, right? So this line, just of the first decree and dealing with the, the lane of the, the return of the people and the lane of the foundation of the temple, under Cyrus's decree, um, that that is a history that parallels our history. And, and it does it on different levels, right? And any thoughts about this? Well, it should be doing it on different levels. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So, so it should be doing it on different levels. So that means that we can zoom in, we can take this history, and we can see this history is going to represent the first angel's message in our history. So we should be able to look at 1989. And that period of 777 days from November 9th, 1989, including December 25th, 1991. So we, we should be able to see a parallel between this history and the first decree. Brother Theodore. Yeah. I'm going to ask this question, and you might not think I know what present truth is, but, and I don't know if it has anything to do with this subject, but. If all all that we study in right now is is it present truth? Yes. Okay. Then. Yeah. So, so the, that means that means the papacy, the papacy is present truth right now, right? Well, everything that's happening right now is is present truth. That is, when we take God's word 
and we apply it to what's happening today. Right. Uh, that, that's present truth. Yeah, the papacy is part of that. Okay. All right, you answered my question. Then. Okay, so why do you bring up that up about the papacy? Because I'm, uh, I don't know how 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 can you separate the papacy from what the um the you can't can you separate the papacy from the lines? I mean, can you can you take in like say that pre, that the papacy ain't present truth for our time? Or do, well, can you, can, you, you can't uh, get rid of the papacy. You know, so, okay, let's look at it this way. We know that the fall of Babylon uh, parallels, right, the fall of Babylon in um, 539 parallels the fall of the papacy in 1798, right? Right. Right, because they're both times of the end, and, and we know that the papacy in 1798, it's going to be, um, uh, pushed at by France, right? That's Daniel 11, mm -hmm. verse 40, 40a, right? So in Daniel 11, verse 40a, we know that this pushing, this is the king of the south, that's going to be France, is going to push at him, the king of the north. Right? Because the him there has to refer to this previous hymn, and this previous hymn is the king of the north, right? So this this is the papacy that's being described in Daniel uh, 36. And the king shall do according to his will, shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, right? And speak marvelous okay. against the god of gods. That's the papacy, right? Okay. So the papacy is part of present truth. Now, right. the papacy is going to be in this case, so in, in in 40A, we know the papacy is going to fall away, right? It's gonna it's it's gonna be taken out of the way, so to speak, right? Oh. Uh, just paganism was in 508, and then um, but then then the papacy, the king of the north, shall come against him, the king of the south. That's 1989. Right. And this is going to lead to the Sunday law. This is the history that we are in. We're in Daniel 11, verse 40 to 45. Yeah. Right. And we know that. Um, and then we're going to have Michael stand up. That's going to be the close of probation. So this history in Daniel 11, 40 to 45 is this history of the papacy. Right. And when we read this, we always read about the papacy. But we know that when we look at this history, it has parallels in other lines and other histories. So one of, the, one of the insights that happened in 2015 had to do with um, uh, the understanding of Daniel chapter 11, verses 1 to 4, that these were showing this history with um, the United States, Medo Persia, so Medo Persia representing the United States, a two horned power, that it's going to have this uh, conflict with, with, um, you know, with Babylon, right? So, so Darius the Mede, he's going to um, conquer Babylon with Cyrus as his general. So, so we can see that there is a parallel in that history. But then when we start to continue to go through Daniel 11, we see that it continues to repeat this history. So in order to understand Daniel 11 correctly, we need to understand the history behind it. Right, okay. And, and in Daniel chapter 10, we can see, I will show thee that which is noted in the scripture of truth. So this, we say that we understand history as it's revealed in scripture, right? So sometimes people look at history, for instance, um, when the Ottoman Empire falls on August 11th, 1840, and they say, well, 
you know, the Ottoman Empire didn't fall on August 11th, 1840. We have to wait till November uh, 1st, you know, 1920 or 21, whatever it is, right? We have to wait till then. But we, we know that's a, that's a progressive fall. Uh, right. But no, from, from the scriptures, what the scripture tries to tell us about prophecy doesn't always line up with how the world looks at prophecy, right? Because we know it has to do with um, the connection with God's people, right? And we need to understand the symbols of what it means. You know, obviously an empire doesn't usually just completely fall in one day, right? But it's just that what occurs with the end of the second woe lines up with what occurred at the beginning of the second woe. Right. So mm -hmm. you have you have, um, uh, you know, Constantine the 11th yielding to the Turkish sultans. And and that's going to lead to then the destruction of, of um, Constantinople. Right. Fall of Constantinople. But at the end of that period, then you're going to see at the end of the second one, you're going to see. um the Turkish Sultan yielding to the four European powers, right? And it's going to be this collective note that's then delivered, um, or this this uh, what's it called? The not the collective note; it's the ultimatum that's delivered to the Pasha of Egypt. And that once that's delivered, then, then uh, Turkey is basically in the hands of these four European powers. So, so when we talk about what's noted in the scripture of truth, we know that the Bible is giving us a guide to understanding this history. And so the papacy has a part to play, obviously, in the Sunday law at the end of the world. Now, we're making applications of these prophecies to, um, to our time dealing with the United States, because what Colin introduced was he connected Daniel 3, Daniel 11, verse 1 to 4, and um, uh, Revelation uh, uh, 17. He connected those together, right? Now, when he did that, there's things that he didn't see fully, right, that we still don't see fully. I'm not saying I see them fully, but there was things that he didn't notice because Sometimes we get a little bit myopic, right, nearsighted, right? So we don't see everything. We're just focused on the one thing. And so he was focused on Trump. But I could see right away that this went further. That is, we had already understood that our lines are, um, that we're repeating, repeating the mistakes of the Millerites. That is, there is a history that we're repeating, which is Millerite history. Uh, addressing the parable of the ten virgins and that the mistakes that the Millerites made are the same mistakes that we have made in, in a parallel sense not identical but in, in a parallel sense they're the same mistakes and, and that is they got a little bit myopic right so they were focused upon the second coming of Christ and began to ignore all of the things that had to happen before Jesus was to return. So we've become focused on Trump and the Sunday law, but ignoring all the things that have to occur before the Sunday law. And one of the huge things is the warning that's got to be given to the world. Right. So can we just have the Sunday law come, let's say, in 2024? If the world has not been warned. And in order for the world to be warned, first Seventh-day Adventists have to be warned, right? Correct. So the message has to go to Seventh-day Adventists. And then Seventh-day Adventists have to give that message. Now, we don't know how that's going to occur. Now, it is interesting, you know. So yesterday was just my first um, online Zoom with this group from Romania. But uh, the pastor there... <clears throat> He has these plans to basically cover the world with the gospel. So he's an ambitious 
young pastor. He's, he's actually a ministerial student. I think he's his last year. Um, so he's going to become an Adventist pastor. And he has this, this vision of giving this gospel to the world. Now, he, he's working with um, uh, gypsies, right? So these are, in some ways, they're still outcasts, right? Romanian gypsies, German gypsies, and Hungarian gypsies. Um, but he has, you know, big plans. Now, however this is going to happen, we know that God is raising up people all over the world who are then going to give this message, right? We don't know who they are. We don't know if what's happening in Romania is going to be connected with that or not. But it seems providential at this time that I'm, you know, connected there and and can have some kind of influence on bringing people back to the understanding of the prophecies that Adventists have had in the past. Because most Adventists are not focused on prophecy. He's focused on prophecy and, and the prophecies that Adventists have understood from how much he understands them. You know, there's obviously a lot more than, than he knows about these prophecies and what they reveal. But the point is, we have a work to do. And right now, God is asking us to be, to use exactitude. That is, we need to be very precise about these things. We need to understand them. So when we start to look at these things, we will see the part that the papacy has to play. We will see the part because these symbols are there. And we will see the part that the United States has to play. And we'll see the part that the globalists have to play, the three parts of Babylon. And, and part of what happened when January 6th occurred is we really weren't prepared for it as a movement, right? So when, when Trump lost the election, I think it was kind of a surprise for everyone. Right? We, we just assumed he was going to win. And then he lo loses the election. And then, of course, there is in the midst of that, this movement is struggling over uh, this Trump prediction, right? So we're having these studies, these Sunday morning studies with FFA regarding Daniel 11, verses 1 to 4. Now, in the middle of that, they're going to cut those off on December 6, 2020. And then because they cut themselves off when the events happened in Nashville on December 25th, and then 13 days later on January 6th, uh, they're out of position to understand what has happened, how God was leading this movement. But, but we can look at these things and we can see that they're tied up, that these events, external events, are tied up with this movement. But they're not events that we predicted. So as we, as we continue to unpackage these 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 uh, verses, I think we're going to see some very amazing things that is really going to help us. And it's going to help us to have a message that we can share with others. That they can see it as well. So I think sometimes we put the cart before the horse. You know, we we looked at the pandemic and said, well, this is the Sunday law. And then we backed off of it and said, well, this is just a type of the Sunday law, but it's going to lead to the Sunday law, which it is. It's it's a precursor to it. But we thought, well, the Sunday law must be about the vaccine or the pandemic or whatever. Right. But it can't be right, because the Sunday law is about what? Is the it's Sunday about law. The Sunday law. It's about the Sunday, it's about Sunday law. law. Right? It's about Sunday and Sabbath, right? It's the conflict between these two days. And so, you know, we had one group, they said, well, no, the Sunday law is about human rights. And, and then when we had, we had another group and said the Sunday law is about human rights, but of course, from a different perspective, from the pandemic, right? Civil rights, you know. But in both cases, they're misleading, they're missing the mark. Right. Because the Sunday law is about the Sunday law. It's not about our civil rights being violated. 
whether, you know, whatever we think those civil rights might be or constitutional rights being violated. It is about worship, which is which is the day that God has given. Is it Saturday or is it Sunday? So so we know that that's the message of, of Adventism. And that's still a message, and it has to be the message. And we're only going to understand it as we understand the past. So I know that's kind of a diversion a bit, but it, it helps us put these things into focus, what it is we're actually studying here. Because we are studying the past, but we're studying the past to understand the present. <clears throat> So this rebuilding of the temple, we know that there's this conflict, and this is going to be part of our lives, right? We're going to see that there's one group that shouts for joy and another group that weeps. Now, which, which group is the correct one to be in? Well, would you want to be shouting for joy? Well, yeah, you, you want to be in the part that recognizes God has been leading you, not the part that is disappointed and, 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 and discouraged because things aren't working out the way you expected. So we can say that this is a disappointment, right? And we have people that can't discern. We can't discern the noise of the shout of joy from the noise of the weeping of the people. Right? So this, these noises are going to be blended together. So we know the next thing that happens is this: these adversaries. And we're going to have to look at these in detail. Now, because um, I'm preparing for the Romanian group i'm also going to do some stuff that uh um with this as well create some charts with it but here it says now when the adversaries of judah and benjamin heard that the children of the captivity builded the temple unto the lord god of israel then they came to zerubbabel and to the chief of the fathers and said unto them let us build with you for we seek your god as ye do and we do sacrifice unto him since the days of esar Hadan, king of Assyria, which brought us up hither. So who is this group of people that were brought by Esar Hayden? So when is this? What are they referring to? Who are they? They're the group that was taken captive in 723, aren't they? Okay, so... So... So we know in 677, Esar Hayden is going to be the king who's going to take Manasseh captive, right? So Esar Hayden isn't in 723. He's in 677. All right. Okay. So in 742, we have um, this 65-year um, prophecy, right? And then within 19 years, right, well, within 65 years, but we know that 19 years later that the second king, the land is going to be forsaken of its first king, 723, that's going to be Hoshea. And then in 677, it's going to be forsaken of its second king, Manasseh. Now, now we know that uh, Hoshea is going to be taken captive to Assyria. Right. And that's going to be Shalmaneser the fifth, who's going to take him to Assyria. And then um, Shalmaneser dies in uh, just in, in December of uh, seven, um, 722. And when he dies, uh, Sargon the second becomes the king of Assyria. And Sargon the second is going to finish the siege. And um, when he finishes the siege, <laughs> he's going to destroy Samaria. And then we know that when Esar Hayden comes, so he's going to come near the end of that 65 years, 
He's going to repopulate the land of Samaria, northern Israel, with people from all these different nations that he has taken captive. And so those people are, are these people. They were brought there by Esar Hayden. And, and some people put it in 677. But, you know, it's around that time, right? So the time when Manasseh is taken captive, there's this eight or nine year period that Esar Hayden is king of Assyria and also king of Babylon. And that's why Esar Hayden can take Manasseh captive and bring him to Babylon because he's the king of Assyria, but he's also the king of Babylon. And that's why we know Manasseh had to be carried captive then because it's the only time he could have been. And Esar Hayden even tells us that he took Manasseh captive along with 20, 21 other kings of the sea coast in Palestine. And he made them haul timber to his palace in Nineveh, right? So first he's going to bring them to Babylon, then he's going to send them out to haul timbers to Nineveh. And this is the affliction that Manasseh experiences. And after that work that he does for Esar Hayden, all of these kings are going to be returned back to their lands because this is the protection racket. So he's demonstrating his power over them and also that he has power to protect them. And so they're going to give their funds to Esar Hayden, right? So that, that's what happens in that history. Now, these people later on become what we call the Samaritans. So there was some people left in the land, but very few, right? When they, did, when they destroyed Samaria in uh, 721, right? Because we know who she is taking captive, 723. And then 721 in the spring, Samaria is going to be destroyed. And many of those people are going to be uh, taken captive. The land's going to be depopulated. But Esar Hayden is going to put people back in the land. And those are what we call the Samaritans. They, they have a mixture of, uh, of the worship of basically northern Israel, which was already Baal worship, um, but also with the places where they came from. So these are the enemies. So these enemies, why, why does Zerubbabel not want them to participate, right? It says, but Zerubbabel and Jeshua, the rest of the chief of the fathers of Israel, said unto them, you have nothing to do with us to build a house unto our God, but we ourselves together will build unto the Lord God of Israel as King Cyrus, the king of Persia, hath commanded us. Right. So why are Zerubbabel and Joshua, why are they not allowing these people to participate in building the house of the Lord? Okay, so this is 1989, right? So what, what is this movement doing in 1989? Building the foundations, I wouldn't. Okay, so, so we're going to lay the foundations of this message. Jeff is going to lay the foundations. Mm -hmm. And he's not going to have the Samaritans participate in this. That is... He's not going to be using the Protestant method of Bible study, right? Correct. Okay. So he says, we have nothing to do with how you're studying the Bible. We have to do according to what God has commanded. Now, he's commanded this through Cyrus. Now, Cyrus is a type of Christ, right? He's a prophetic symbol. And so we can take what happens with Cyrus and we can we can put it at 1989, just as we can put it at 539 and 537 and 536. And we can see that that is um, that Christ is actually leading this movement. He has given us a command. Because Cyrus is the Lord's anointed. Right. So we can say that Christ is, is really the Lord's anointed. In our history, and Christ is going to be instructing Jeff. And he's going to lay this foundation. 
But the people of the land weakened the hands of the people of Judah and troubled them in building. So do we have the work of the enemies happening in our history? Did it happen? Was Jeff attacked? Yes, he was. Yeah. Multiple okay. times. And they hired counselors against them to frustrate their purpose all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even until the reign of Darius, king of Persia. Now, we know Darius is going to represent the second message. That's going to represent 9-11, 9-11 as the arrival of the second message. And then it says, in the reign of Ahasuerus, in the beginning of his reign, wrote they unto him an accusation against the inhabitants of Judah and Jerusalem. So this is where we're going to start looking at. Um, tomorrow, we're going to look at this history and understand. So when we see the reign of Ahasuerus, many people just think that's Xerxes, because Xerxes is referred to as Ahasuerus. This is actually more a title. And also, you're looking at a Greek name of from a Persian name. And so there was a lot of confusion. And you can kind of see um, how, how Ahasuerus is rated uh, related to the name Artaxerxes as well, right? Because you have you have Hebrew names and you have Greek names, Artaxerxes and Xerxes. Those are actually Greek. Okay, so so we're going to look at these names. So we're going to have Ahasuerus. So we need to know who he is. Um. And then in the days of Artaxerxes, so most people think, well, this is Ahasuerus, is Xerxes. And then the days of Artaxerxes, that must be Artaxerxes Longimanus, right? Uh, but it's, this is actually not, right? This is false smirtus. So, so we'll, we'll see that. Ellen White marks this out clearly. So there's going to be, in the days of Ahasuerus, we'll see that that's Cambyses. And then this Artaxerxes here, that's actually false smirtus. And, and we'll see how this uh, this history uh, works out, right? So, and then you're going to, so then we'll go into the rebuilding of this. Haggai and Zechariah are going to be mentioned in chapter five. <clears throat> so hopefully this is, is making sense how we're laying this out. I mean, I'm still leaving some details out here, but as we start to draw these on the line, we'll start to bring these details into that line. And any thoughts on this at this point? Like I was thinking that Hazras, like Hazras, well, Hazras, like as he's talked of there, I know that he's the one Zaxis. That's that has been in me for quite a long time. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So mostly we think that this is Xerxes, but Ellen White quotes this verse. And she clearly marks that this is uh, not Xerxes, but it's Cambyses. And then this art of Xerxes here in verse 7, uh, she's going to tell us plainly that that's false smirts. Right. So Ellen White marks this out clearly who these are. And also it wouldn't really make any sense if you made this Xerxes and this uh, uh, art of Xerxes. Because when you start to read the story, you realize it's not possible that that's the case. So these are these are the kings that are following. So you've got uh, after Cyrus is going to be Cambyses. There's going to be the opposition of the enemies there. And then under false Smyrtus, then the temple is going to stop, be stopped being built. And then in chapter five, it's going to follow that the temple is going to be uh the building of it is going to resume, and that's going to be under the prophesying of Haggai and Zechariah. And Haggai and Zechariah are long before Xerxes and Artaxerxes. <clears throat> so, so it's just yeah. These we need to recognize that these names in in the scripture are often not as clear as as you would think because these are are more titles than anything. Um, Artaxerxes is not really a name of a person. Neither is Ahasuerus a name of a person. These are titles. Even Darius is not a name of a person. 
<clears throat> okay, so, so we're going to look at this. We're going to go through the spirit of prophecy, what she says about this, and we're going to go through the Bible and show how this history is to be laid out. But yeah, I've, I've run into people who just make the assumption that that's Xerxes and that's Artaxerxes, but then the story doesn't fit if you do it that way. <clears throat> but but the way they read this is they go, they hired councils to frustrate them all the days of Cyrus, king of Persia, even unto the reign of Darius, king of Persia, right? That's what they do. And then they say, and in the reign of Ahasuerus, that's Xerxes, he comes after Darius. And then in the days of Artaxerxes, well, he comes after Xerxes, right? So that's how they read it. But if you read it all the way through and look at it in detail, that is, if you are um, using exactitude, you start to recognize that that's not the case. That it's just um, it's just an assumption people make. So hopefully that's that's helpful there. But thanks thanks for the the comment. So so we need to understand these things correctly, and that means it's going to take some digging. Now of course I've done this in the past, so you know I. I've, I've drawn a conclusion already, but we're going to look at it together. And then we can see um, the different sides, the different views, and, and try to understand this so that we can be solid in what we believe. Because if we just kind of brush aside things we don't agree with, and we don't look at their reasons, um, then if we become confronted with them later on, we may be confused. So, so we need to know for certain as we study through these things. So any final comments before we close with prayer? Okay, let's pray. Dear Father in heaven, thank you for the study this morning, the things that you are teaching us, the things that you've been showing us in your word. And I pray for each person that they can search these things out for themselves and that you can be with us as we examine these things throughout this week. I pray for each one. I know, Lord, there's many things we struggle with, and we need you in our lives, so we give our lives to you. We give you our heart, our mind, our body. We ask that you can use us to your glory. Forgive us for our sins. Help us depend upon you. We pray and ask this in Jesus' name. Amen.